Yeah. Yeah. Well, good evening. Thank you for coming out. Another gorgeous spring day. Uh, extra warm today. I think got up to about 82 or 83. And uh, it's supposed to be back cooler tomorrow, but still very nice and dry. And we have a big holiday weekend, a long weekend. Uh, Miriam will not be in the office Friday. She's taking that half day off. And then, of course, the office will be closed Monday. But if you need us, Faith and I will be here. Uh, we'll be glad to serve, and uh, we'll just do our very best. Let me share with you just a few announcements. Uh, of course, the big thing coming up is Vacation Bible School. Uh, that begins next week uh, on the 5th, uh, and we just look forward to those kinds of things, 5th of June, the week after this. So keep that in mind. We do have, uh, we're going to go to the neighborhoods around Cold Spring and hand out VBS and Music Camp uh, flyers to help inform all of our kids and their parents about it. And uh, if you would like to sign up, this sign-up sheet is right here. I'll make sure that it's on the communion table. Uh, actually, maybe I'll put it back on the, the uh, Bible study table. And if you would, I'll lay this ink pen with it, and we'll make sure you get a chance. But if you had some time tomorrow evening, that's from 5.30 to 8.30 to hand out that. We want to make sure our local communities are invited to Vacation Bible School, so we'll keep that in mind, too. Also, we'd mention to you, we have a new Bible study coming up on Sunday nights. Uh, this Sunday evening, we're going to be in Bethlehem and the southern part of Israel for uh, the sanctuary class, and then Alan Daigle and uh, Deb Whitaker are going to be teaching a, a class, and it's called The Shocking Disconnect, Why Christians Fail to Impact Culture. And that'll be available downstairs in the big Sunday school room. And I'm not the least bit offended if you want to go to that, none whatsoever. Uh, tonight we'll, like I say, Sunday night we'll do Bethlehem and southern Israel all the way to the Red Sea. And then we have one more Sunday night in June. And I'm, I wanted to spend the whole evening on Jerusalem. It's just so saturated with information and biblical stories and the like, so we've got two more Sunday nights for that. Also, we'd mention to you, um, uh, they had their first class today and had some folks show up late for, for Grief Share, and it's not too late to join Grief Share. Please, 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 if you know somebody, give them John Shea's phone number or Marguerite's phone number if they feel more comfortable talking to a woman, and they would be glad to invite them to that class and give them everything they needed. Last week we had 15 at the Coffee with the Pastor. This week we had 14. But when, when all the folks come in, it looks like the parking lot is full. When really it's two different, two different operations and that is available. So we'll keep that in mind. But Vacation Bible School is the big event coming up. Now I would mention to you Sunday is uh, uh, Baptism Sunday. It's also Memorial Day weekend Sunday. And uh, um, we... You know me, I don't call off on Sunday evening. So if you want to come and, and go through um, the Negev Desert with me and visit Bethlehem, see some of these other places that we saw on our most recent trip to Israel, we'll be glad to share that with you. Any other announcement you'd like to make? Then I'm going to... Please, Marguerite. Absolutely. It's hard to teach one. I've done it. I've done it in the past, but it's more difficult. It's better the more we have. So if you have someone, please connect them with John and Marguerite, and they would be glad to plug them into the class, bring them up to speed, make sure they have everything they need. And one final thing, don't forget, we will have our business meeting. It's an important business meeting because we have uh, the deacon list of uh, everything else to improve about the deacons. We have two that have been uh, presented, nominated, that will need to be ordained, and we'll need your approval of that. We'll do that on a Sunday night, too, right, right as soon as possible. Uh, we will look at the prayer list in just a moment, but any other announcements? Thank you so much, if you will. We'll turn it over to Miss Jackie and ask her to help us worship God. 
Well, as uh, Pastor Rick starts, it continues to teach on the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord brought the, the, the song Shine, Jesus, Shine to my heart, and it's, a, it's an old new song, but it reminds me that there are just so many facets to God's character, and the Holy Spirit gently nudges us, the Holy Spirit project, uh, protects us, but also he sets our hearts on fire. There's this uh, proactive stance that the Holy Spirit takes and a protective stance. And so in this song, we sing about uh, him setting our hearts on fire to uh, reflect Jesus as well. So it's a more spirited song. And even though you guys can hear me, I can't hear you unless you sing heartily. So I would appreciate it if you sang heartily tonight. And stand up and join me if you're physically able. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Please be replaced. Set our hearts on fire. Flow with the power of the nations with grace and mercy. since this morning, uh, Sarah Roseberry, uh, Bob and Carol's daughter, was on vacation and was struck with a sev such a severe kidney stone that she had to have it surgically removed. And so please remember Sarah, and, and being sick at home is bad, being sick a thousand miles from home is even more difficult, so please remember them. Don't forget uh, Billy and Becky Wilson. Uh, Becky was here Sunday, and I, I, I watched you. I watched you encourage Becky, and it's just right. It's just sweet, and thank you for that. Uh, don't forget Bob and Deb Stallhut. Bob uh, has had his uh, biopsy on his lung to make sure that the transplant is taking, 
He is doing better day by day. He is getting out. Uh, they actually have been out to eat and the like, so they're just enjoying that. We want to remember them. Uh, we've mentioned to you Harold and Margie Comer. Is, am I saying that right, Priscilla? Coomer. Uh, both of them in great need, family members of, of Pris and Knowles, and we want to lift them up. We'd also mention to you Don and Judy Eubanks. Don had a pacemaker replacement here about two weeks ago. They were back Sunday and is doing better. And then David and Cheryl Reinhardt. Cheryl had a biopsy on Monday, came back today, and it is benign, so they're very thankful for that. And we got word that David's uh, esophageal cancer is is getting smaller because of the treatment, so we're thankful for that. We'd mention to you uh, Margaret Griffin. Uh, Margaret, I'm looking, there she is right here with us. Margaret, is, our, is it all right if I share what's going on? Is it okay if I tell them what you're doing? We'd mention to you Margaret has stage four cancer. She has two lymph nodes that are involved, and next week, She's going to have a cat scan, or a pet, pet scan and a brain scan to see if it's involved anywhere else. Where this tumor is at, is it is not surgically possible to remove. So they're formulating a plan, and Margaret, we're playing, praying for you and lifting you up. Absolutely. Uh, I've mentioned to you um, Kathy Morsher, um, young expectant mom, Shelby Dunaway, and this is Cecile and Lee Maxey's granddaughter. I mentioned to you Angela Reynolds and lift them up. Diane Burns, Burns had an outpatient procedure yesterday and she should know tomorrow or Friday about the outcome of that. I would mention to you uh, Sylvia having a, some uh, outpatient procedure here tomorrow to help her with her pain. Uh, my good friend and classmate Don Wellman uh, his mother, well up in her 80s, Nola, has been at the family farm for over 70 years, up Cyrus Hollow, it's called Greenbrier. She has mowed her own yard up until this year, and the other day she wasn't able to get out and get up and get moving, and she has been put into J.J. Jordan Geriatric Center in Lawrence County, and Don asks that we pray for his sweet mom. Uh, she and my mother are very close, so please remember them. We also had a special request from Deb Mullins for Rich Higgins, a um, um, nephew in his 50s that had a severe stroke. We want to remember him. And um, we got word here early this morning that there's a super typhoon hitting Guam, and uh, military men and women that are stationed there uh, are just on high alert. Please remember that. And remember all of our military and... Uh, I just, I just wanted you to know that yesterday, Bob Watson got to go take the honor flight, and Bob, was it what you expected or better? Was your honor flight what you expected or better? More. Well, Bob Watson was a rock star for a day, and we've always thought something of you, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. And we appreciate that, and... Uh, Honor, honor to whom honor is due. Um, we'd also mention to you, uh, don't forget our missionaries. I would mention to you that uh, the Mitchams in Thailand are offering online some t-shirts and really not so much to raise a lot of funds, but more to raise awareness. And if you go on their Facebook page, it's just an opportunity for you to kind of advertise, wear the t-shirt this summer. And somebody said, what's that about? Oh, let me tell you a story about three gorgeous little blonde-headed girls and their mom and dad that are serving God in Thailand, and we'll appreciate them too. Also, I think this weekend there's a good chance we'll get to see Will and Barb's daughter Christy and Yoel and their boys, and we're so looking forward to having them with, some, with us, and uh, maybe during the process we'll get a chance to introduce them to the church and just love on them a little bit that way too. Um, the newsletters are going out. I'm sure Sister Jerry would love to have that. The sooner, the better. And uh, I've already got my article into her, and uh, um, um, it's just something that we need to do to stay connected. I will say one of our members today turned 95. Earl, Earl Wills. Uh, they, he. 
Cheryl and Joe went down to visit him, took him a little birthday cake, and he said, I have a bone to pick with First Baptist Church. They didn't mention that I was 95 years old. So now you can go home and tell him I mentioned he was 95. <laughs> and, and maybe we'll get back on the gold star list. But uh, Earl is one of those great uh, ones that we inherited from First Baptist Church Newport. And we are blessed to be a small part of his life too. Anything else? Who else would you like to mention tonight for prayer requests? I know uh, Carolyn uh, Crail is home with a severe headache. Please remember Carolyn. Someone else? Please, Will. Okay. Okay. Remember Barb and her family as they deal with that. Someone else? Please, Deb. Sure. Art Wilson. Uh, Colin and I have been blessed to go to three nursing homes in the last two days. Uh, please remember that that work is just so important. And uh, Dottie True is not doing very well. If you go to visit her, she may not remember you. Keep that in mind if you go to look in on Dottie. Someone else. Please, Sylvia. Okay. I, I remember hearing about that, but it's just a sad situation. And we had a sheriff's deputy down in Scott County that was shot and killed this week, um, just doing his job, just doing his job. And we... <coughs> I cannot imagine the grief of that family and the whole police force, really the whole community around Georgetown. Please remember them. This young man at Coryville and this sheriff's deputy just a couple of three counties down from us. Yeah, sad. Someone else? Unspoken, just for lifting your hand. There are quite a few of those too. And God knows your heart. And we believe in the power of prayer. Anyone else? I don't want to rush you at all. I've asked Mason uh, to pray for us tonight. Mason, if you'll pray for us, we'll pray for you as you lift us up. All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we want to first of all thank you for uh, the blessing of getting together in your house tonight. Thank you for the opportunity of fellowship that we have and that dinner earlier tonight and just being able to spend time with each other. But... Uh, also want to lift up uh, thanks and praise to you for blessing this church the way that you have, particularly uh, uh, for all the uh, ways in which you've healed those who we've been praying about for so long. Uh, praise you for Bob Stallhood. Praise you for uh, David Reinhardt and Cheryl. But also want to lift up those who are uh, still suffering. And I, Lord, honestly, I can't remember all their names, but I know you heard every single one of those prayer requests. I pray for those who are recovering from surgeries, those who are going into surgeries, and those who are in nursing homes. Uh, just pray that you would be with them and minister to them in their ever need. I want to lift up uh, um, the future of this church as we go into a season of uh, vacation Bible school. I want to pray over that, and I want to pray that you be exalted in that and uh, that you are glorified and that these children will uh, come to know you as Savior and Lord by the end of the week. And I want to lift up the lost world that we find ourselves living in. And I don't understand why people do the things that they do, but one thing is clear. It's because they need to know you as their Lord and Savior. And so I lift that up to you. Lift all these things up in Jesus' name and amen. Thank you, Mason. If you will take your copy of God's Word, we're going to begin in Corinthians tonight, First and Second Corinthians. So as we mention this to you, we're going to continue in the vein of of the Holy Spirit, and the idea being the Holy Spirit gives us the power to change. Paul directly addresses one of the difficulties of the Holy Spirit 
especially when we start talking about the entire spiritual realm of who the Holy Spirit is, what He does in us while we're here in this flesh, and how He He creates the process by which when we get to heaven, we have a spiritual body. Now, I can't explain that fully because I don't understand it. I've sat in classes and had theological professors try to explain that to me at length, and I've never, ever fully been satisfied. I understand that it won't be exactly the same. Well, who would want this old body? <laughs> I mean, with you, mine, mine is starting to misbehave, and I don't like that. And, and I want a better body, and God has promised us a better body and a mind like unto Christ. But the whole process is driven by God, by His grace, by His mercy, and by His implanting, or the theological term is imputing, placing the Holy Spirit into us at the moment of salvation. Now, some churches might tell you that that happens at your baptism. I see nowhere in Scripture that you could directly relate to that. Now, we do see when Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water that the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove and lit on him, and the voice of God the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. But, beloved, it's not a question of how of, of extra or second blessings or tertiary blessings, but it's a question of how much of yourselves do do we give to the Holy Spirit? The Spirit is real. He is alive and well. He's that invisible part of God in every believer. And he starts that process. And what did we say were the three primary jobs of the Holy Spirit? One is to convict us when we sin, to convince us when we doubt, and to comfort us when we grieve or hurt. So those are the three primary roles of the Holy Spirit. Now, he does much more than that. But those umbrellas, that simple three-stage umbrella, is what covers us the vast majority of the time. And uh, we, we can have a conscience that gets seared, gets numb to sin. But when you're a believer, the Holy Spirit won't let that happen very long without God creating a course correction in your life. So if you will, we want to see what Paul talked about. Turn, if you will, to 2 Corinthians and this is chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and we'll review this together. Paul is going to talk to us about the importance of the resurrection, what difference that makes. But in the process, after the resurrection, uh, you realize this is, this is actually, uh, we're real close to Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection. You remember when Easter was, if you count 50 days, this is Pentecost. <clears throat> Should I tell this? Are the cooks here? You remember when we did the Passover service? Uh, I had that chocolate cake with the nuts and the whipped cream and the strawberry on top tonight. That was actually Passover cake. Okay, so Passover has happened. They put it in the freezer, and I promise you... Uh, it did me no harm, okay? It was good cake. Actually, it was scratch cake. We had uh, some years ago a little Filipino lady uh, in our church that, that would listen to the women talk about recipes and baking and the like, and, and she was so offended when she went to the grocery store and looked up and down the baking aisle and never found scratch. <laughs> and, and our ladies laughed and they corrected that, and she finally laughed too. But it was a good cake. So we had Passover back just before Easter. Easter happened, resurrection, resurrection Sunday, and now we're about Pentecost is about the time that we're in right now. So what happened at Pentecost? The Bible said in the words of Jesus, he wanted his apostles, his believers, his disciples, his followers to tarry in Jerusalem. Wait here. Don't do anything. Don't go anywhere until... You are subdued and the Holy Spirit is given to you because why? The Holy Spirit helps the whole process. The conviction, the convincing, and the comforting. All three of those things. So we need, to, we need that to be able to do what God wants from us. Can a person, just educationally, 
can a person educationally go to bible college go to seminary get the words right teach the lessons correct as much as possible and be blessed by studying god's word can we do that i mean apart from the holy spirit apart from salvation if someone wanted to try to live the ten commandments would it bless them sure it would sure it would now i don't get i don't believe they get the full effect because they don't get the holy spirit but the idea is we can do it legalistically, we can do it logically, we can do it educationally, and we can benefit from doing what the Bible says. But if we're going to walk in the power of God, God's Spirit has to dwell in us. And to do that, we have to receive the Holy Spirit like they did on the day of Pentecost. Now, for me, I was just a punk of a kid when I trusted Christ as my Savior. I had no clue what all of that meant. I would never have understood what the Holy Spirit was doing in me, but I do know that it start, He started to change my life every single time I was exposed to the Word of God. That's what He does. And if you come at nine years old or you come at 59 years old, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, He dwells within you, and He begins that process of making you more and more like Christ. When you fail, He convicts you. When you, when you hurt, he comforts you. When you struggle with intellectual understanding, and I, I can't tell you thousands upon thousands of times I've struggled, struggled with the scripture and sometimes in the middle of my sleep dreamed the answer. And it's not me. I mean, when you're dreaming, are you in control? No way. But the Holy Spirit exposes and expounds on that truth. So I want you to notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Then we're going to skip back to 1 Corinthians and one other passage of Scripture this evening to kind of flesh out this Bible study. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building with God from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, doesn't that sound like a lofty statement? Why? How could Paul even say that? Well, did he have extra information? Did he go and take a class on that? Did he have a good professor in Bible college? Actually, all of this is given, driven by the Holy Spirit. So would you agree with me when I say this, that whether it's Moses or the Old Testament prophets or the gospel writers or the New Testament disciples and apostles who wrote the New Testament, really they just become scribes of what the Holy Spirit wants printed. You see what I'm saying? It, it, we, we love Paul. Paul wrote more, let me see this, Luke wrote more volume in the New Testament than any other New Testament writer. He wrote two books, the Gospel of Luke and what else? Acts of the Apostles. So he wrote those two books, and there are more verses, more words in those two books than all the other individual writers of the New Testament. Paul wrote more books, but not more volume. And yet, every time you read one of Paul's words, you need to keep in the back of your mind, this was inspired by the Holy Spirit. I heard uh, <laughs> recently they had discovered, uh, an uncovered an, a, a once lost book, lost chapter in the book of Matthew. There's an extra chapter in Matthew and they're trying to present that today as if it's something that God either forgot about or didn't include until now. Let me tell you, anytime you hear something about that new, you know, discovering new books, other new, you be extra, extra careful. Maybe good stories, maybe interesting to read. But are they the inspired Word of God? We have 66 books that thousands upon tens of thousands of scholars have poured over, many different denominations, and, and they've looked at it. We have 39 books in the Old Testament, uh, 27 books in the New Testament. All of them are inspired of God. How do I know that? Because they have stood the test of critical thinking, and they've stood the test of time. So when Paul says this, we credit Paul for writing 2 Corinthians, but don't ever forget that the Holy Spirit is driving his pen, okay? 
Notice verse number 2. Uh, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. <clears throat> we were at uh, Carmel Manor today, and we sang uh, a lot of heaven songs today at Carmel Manor. And I said, just as soon as we're done, I'm loading up a bus and taking everybody that wants to go to heaven. And the biggest smile broke out over all the room. You see, they're groaning. Their physical flesh, they're groaning within their spirit. You ever get so sick you thought you were going to die? And in that process of that sickness, when you thought you were going to die, you had to decide, am I ready? That's a wonderful moment if you're ready. If you're not, it's correcting, and it brings us back to this point. But this is the idea. This, when this earthly flesh diminishes to the point to where we no longer have a quality life, that's the groaning that happens. Um, I, I want you to look around. Can I give you permission to look around Sunday morning and see our seniorest of adults come in the building? Many of them are on canes. Some are on walkers. Some may even come in a wheelchair. Why in the world? It would be so much easier for them to stay at home. It would be so much easier for them to just stay there, uh, pop a couple of Tylenol, and just stay at home. They have a dedication and they have a love for the presence of God in this sanctuary, and they want to be here. And when they come in, what do they do? Their body's misbehaving. They feel this physical pain. They ache when they walk, but they come here anyway because why? Because they know that this body will one day drop and go back to the dust from where it came, and God will release the spirit and soul. But we won't be, and I say this intentionally, you're not going to be a ghost, a haint. <laughs> you're not just going to be this wafting spirit that's going to go all around the cloud. We, we will not, I know some of you... I've, if you have some honorary family members, I know you'd like to haunt them, but God's got better things for you to do. Now, verse 3, if indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. This is what Paul is saying. He is saying this because Jesus, when he came back here after the resurrection, had a resurrection body. Now, it was a superior body because walls and windows and locks did not appear did not hinder him. You remember when they were in the upper room and he appeared in the upper room and Thomas wasn't there and they couldn't believe it. They told Thomas about it. He said, I won't believe it until I place my finger in the nail prints in his hands. I won't believe it until I thrust my hand in the gaping hole in his side. And he appeared the next week with all the doors and windows being locked. And this is where we find this. This is the intention. It is this supernatural divine body and how do we know it was an actual body what did Jesus do on the seashore of Galilee when Peter dove into the water and met him on the shore he had broiled fish he fed him honeycomb he ate with them he fellowshiped with them they touched him so he does have a superior body now I know this sounds like science fiction but isn't it nice when science fiction agrees with Scripture? Now again, science fiction can't prove or disprove Scripture, but it gives us a larger imagination for this thought process. 4 verse 4, For we who are in this tent groan, there's that word again, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed or graduate to heaven, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And when he says that, he means eternal life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is who? God, who also has given us the Spirit, and that's capital S, as a guarantee. So that's what I want us to understand tonight. We have this spirit body. Once we graduate out of this place, the earthly body will, is, is our old house. Who was it, Tennessee Ernie Ford? You remember his song? I ain't gonna need this house no longer. I ain't gonna need this house no more. I ain't got time to fix the hinges. I ain't got time to fix the door. So, what, isn't that the way it went? 
And and he was he wasn't talking about his house He was talking about his spiritual house this earthly house was diminished the spiritual house Would you trade up if you had the chance today I'll guarantee if you're sitting here in pain tonight you'd say in a minute in a New York minute I would trade up but the idea is this is what we know don't we we know what we know but therein lies the problem we don't know what we don't know and it's hard for me to describe something so divine so amazing so spiritual that only God only God could fully expose it so this is the guarantee fan over if you will to 1 Corinthians 15 44 and I think in this case Paul is going to repeat some of what he said in 2 Corinthians uh, but he explains it a little bit more 1 Corinthians 15 44 now, now you have to understand of course and I know you do this is obvious this is Rhetorical. First Corinthians comes before Second Corinthians, but I, want, I wanted to give you the five verses in Second Corinthians five to make First Corinthians fifteen forty four leap out off the page to you. Notice what it says. First Corinthians fifteen forty four. It is sown a natural body. Um, my. My grandma Frazier loved to garden. She planted cucumbers. If I remember right, she planted cucumbers. Was it Grandma Frazier? On May the 13th, she held up 13 hills and put 13 cucumber seeds in 13 hills. So there, there was a lot. And I love cucumbers. So, not, And you either love them or you hate them. I don't know anybody in between. But but she had all of these. She had. I don't know whether that was something superstitious I'm not sure but keep in mind that's what this is talking about you have to place the seed in the ground you have to uh, cover it up you have to water it you have the sun has to come out it has to be the right temperature and that's what Paul is talking about as if this earthly body is sown into this soil of the earth it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body there is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So, what is that spirit body like? What's the Holy Spirit got to do with this? I've got three points that I think we can kind of cover relatively quick. First of all, when we're saved, we receive the Holy Spirit for a reason. One is to help us mature, but in a way, the Holy Spirit is a guarantee. Now, when you think of that word... The guarantee that we have in this world, all the advertisements there, lifetime guarantee. Anybody believe that? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, they, they're, they're vehicles now. They'll guarantee the car for a lifetime, but you have to take it to them for every service. For every, You have to do all the services, everything else. So, so a $25,000 car is going to cost you $100,000 before you're done. You have to do it, but it's a lifetime guarantee. That's not the kind of guarantee that God gives us. God gives us the Holy Spirit. And the God that I serve, and I know it's not politically correct, but God, the God that I serve, the God of Scripture, is not an Indian giver. When he gives you something, it's a done deal. What does Jesus say when he was headed back to heaven? He said, I will not forsake you. I will not leave you as orphans. When God gives us something, it is a gift that is eternal. Well, Brother Rick, you're just one of those once in grace, always in grace people. I wear it like a badge of honor. It's a medal. I wear that because I see that everything that God does, he does. Everything he commences, he completes completely. But this is the idea that when this earthly body, which is not because of its brokenness, because of its humanity, because of its pollution, this human pollution that we carry, we were born in this natural body. It was born broken. It was born, it, even though God planned it from the beginning to live forever, 
God had to restore that and give us salvation. So he, to get to heaven, we have to have this spirit body. Now, what does that look like? You see, that's God's purpose. He gives us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Now, again, when we talk about eternal security, I don't want you to think that God wastes his grace on non-believers. It's not like I can walk down the aisle of First Baptist Church, shake the preacher's magic hand, then I can go and live any old way I please. Not with the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. When the Holy Spirit's dwelling within you, you have to live a different life. And when you go against the grain of God's Word and God's Holy Spirit, He brings you back. So when we look at this, um, we don't want to look at God as a holy fire escape or a spare tire that we bring out when we have a flat in our life or an umbrella when we have a storm. Uh, actually, God is not this remote part of our life. When the Holy Spirit dwells within us, He is our spiritual engine that drives the power of the Word of God in us. So it's in a way, it's like earnest money, okay? And I guess that's the best illustration that I can think of. Uh, let's say you go to buy a house, okay? You go to a realtor, you broker a deal, you sign a contract, and to guarantee that you'll follow through with the deal, you put down earnest money. In a way, that's what the Holy Spirit is. Now, um, with God, what He begins, He finishes. So keep that in mind. The Holy Spirit is like earnest money. He's God's promise that He is going to keep the in His part of the bargain. Brother Rick, do you have one single thing that tells me that that's exactly so? I'll give you one word, and I think it'll prove it without any explanation. Israel. Are you hearing my heart? Israel gave God multitudes of chances to just write them off, to wash his hands of them, and he never, ever did. He never did. They're still his chosen people, and they're still being blessed by God because God keeps his covenant, and he always will. Number two, God will fulfill his purpose in us. Uh, And when I say this, I, I, don't, I don't really have a good way of explaining it. But have you ever gone someplace that used to, you could go and sit down and feel completely comfortable? But when you get into God's Word and God's Spirit begins to help grow you, you go back to that place and you have a funky feeling that something's weird is wrong. What's going on there? Help me with that. Something has changed, hasn't it? Are you, are you the same person? Well, not exactly, are we? We've, we? Maybe it's part of it is being convicted by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, but we've also grown to the place to where... Let me, let me just bring it back to something really simple. I'm, I've always been a big gearhead. I've always loved tinkering on cars and trucks and motorcycles and the like. Let's say this. When I was young, what was your dream car when you were 16 years old? What? Mustang. A Mustang. What, 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 somebody else? I'm, I'm still listening. I'm, I thought you said Fiero, a Pontiac Fiero, and I thought, no way. A Camaro. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted a Corvette. My brother had a 77 Corvette Stingray Canary Yellow. He wrapped it around a telephone pole in Lexington, Kentucky and walked away from it. I, I've, I've ridden and driven Corvettes. Do, do you see my physique? If you take a good-sized shoehorn, you can get me into a Corvette. You can get me into a Mustang. You can get me into a Camaro. Why didn't we want those cars? They were flashy. They were fast. They were cool. You know what I want now? 
Something that's efficient and reliable and comfortable. And paid for. There you go. You know, I, that's why I'm still driving a new 2004 model Ford truck. I can, I, you know, I don't have to worry about gas prices when my truck is paid for. I, you hear this? Am I a radically different person than I was when I was 16? Just ask my wife. That's about the time she met me. I, I, I see these pictures of these little boys with uh, with their pants and their little khakis and their sports shirts and, and the little hat pulled down, kind of cocked that way. I look at the pictures that these moms and grandmoms are putting on, on Facebook and I think to myself, never in my whole life have I been that cool. I wanted to be that cool, but I'm not. And now, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a Corvette. If you have a Corvette, honest, loan it to me. I'll drive it. I wouldn't have a problem. I <clears throat> had a friend of mine at, at First Baptist Church, Louisa, that bought a Porsche Boxster. I mean, he could afford it anything he wanted. Bought a cobalt blue Porsche Boxster. He said, Brother Rick, I'm going to be out of town. Why don't you take this this week? And I said, I will. <laughs> now, you have to imagine here, I'm driving from Louisa to Ashland where the big hospital is, and they have dedicated uh, <laughs> clergy parking in the parking garage across from King's Daughters Hospital. And I wheel in there in that little sports car. It's like a roller skates on wheel. <laughs> I slip in there, and I hit the button, and the top goes... <laughs> And I step out, and the nurses are coming out from their shift. It's about 7 o'clock at night, and they look at me like, you dog, there's no way in the world a preacher is driving this car. You hear what I'm saying? When we're younger, we don't have, our, our brain isn't fully formed. And I don't say that to be offensive to those of you who are, who are wonderful and beautiful and smart and young. But what I, what, mine didn't form until I was 25 or 26. Faith has the most patience of anybody I know in this church. But what happened is my tastes have changed because they have matured. When you were a kid, you ate a lot of oatmeal, a lot of pinto beans, a lot of cornbread. You thought, man, oh man, when I get older, I'm going to eat Pop-Tarts. I'm going to go out to eat all the time. I'll never eat oatmeal again. But the thing is, the Holy Spirit grows you like you grow physically. The, yeah, the Holy Spirit grows you. And what you used to desire, what you used to feel comfortable at, what you used to do, now is not even appealing anymore. That's God changing us. That's God moving us. And like I say, if you have you a new Porsche, I'll drive it for you. I have no problem with that. But I'm probably, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go out and buy that. I don't need that now. In fact, actually, if I could have a car back, I had a 69 Mustang Mach 1, 351 Canadian built Windsor. I, I would like to have had that back. I, I would have, the only other car I had, I had that I really liked was an 80, Seven Buick Roadmaster. It's like sitting on the couch when you sat in that thing. It floated along. It was a, it was just a dream car. But anyhow, now that this body's misbehaving, I keep thinking, one of these days, you're going to hear of Rick Fraser's death. One of these days, you're going to hear, of my, read my obituary. And I want you to think this. He is right where he wants to be with a new spiritual body, no longer hindered by the flesh, no, one, no longer limited by a hillbilly brain, no longer, as some of you are relating way too close, I'll move on. Uh, but the idea is God is going to fulfill his purpose in us as much as we allow here, but when you get to heaven, you're going to have a perfect mind, a perfect body, perfect understanding, and it will not hurt to get out of bed in the mornings. It just won't. Number three, when we receive the Holy Spirit, there's a whole lot bigger concept 
uh, than mankind can offer. When I say this, the Spirit, when you trust in Christ and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you, you don't have instant onset intelligence and all biblical understanding. It's a process, and you have to trust the process. But the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. Now, Nicole, she, she takes a lot of notes. And you check me out, don't you? When I say something, it just I want to tell you how much that encourages my heart. That she takes notes, she goes home, she restudies. When you do that, it becomes yours. How many times have you heard me say, don't take my word for it? You know what the Bible says? Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you something a little bit gross. You know where they get baby food in the Eskimo tribes of Alaska and above the tundra circle? The mother chews up the food and then puts it in the baby's mouth and the babies eat it like it's the best thing in the world. It's pre-chewed food. Now, I, I, I hope you don't think this Sunday morning when I stand up to preach. But when I preach or when I teach, it's pre-chewed scripture. And if you really want to change your life, if you really want to grow in Christ, you need to study to show yourself approved unto God. You know what the scripture says in 1 Timothy? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man, the people, all of mankind will be perfect. That means complete, thoroughly furnished. Well, Brother Rick, when I read it, I don't get that much out of it. You know why that is? You don't spend enough time. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm... I promise you, I'm not nearly the... I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than I look, but I'm not as smart as I wish I was. Does that make sense? The reason that I can do this is because I've done it for 47 years as pastor and longer than that as a student. The more you study it, the better you get. The more proficient you get. And you can do that too. You don't have to go... And I, I don't have... I wish everybody could go to Bible college or seminary. But let me tell you, I have learned so much more by being a good student of God's Word than I've ever learned by being smart. Does that make sense? I hope that's not contradictory. One last scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. When I look at this... Um, when we trust Christ, the, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, and one of the first steps of obedience is a public confession, and you'll see some of that Sunday during the baptisms. Now, now again, the baptism is, is simple obedience, but when you take those baby steps, God gives you more grace. He leads you, He teaches you, He helps you, and it just is so much more productive. Notice what it says. 2 Timothy 1, 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue by which, having been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Now remember, the first promise is the Holy Spirit. He's in us. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Adam and Eve lusted to be their own boss to go against God and it cost them it crippled them and every generation after them but the Holy Spirit comes in and he says you're not perfect yet but one day you will when you get to heaven and when we look at this the Holy Spirit is that earnest money that guarantee that you're going to make it 
Brother Rick, sometimes I just feel so defeated. Welcome to the club. I've been president of that club more than once. But the idea is ultimately the ultimate gain is not because you're good or because you're Baptist or because you behave. The ultimate growth is because the Holy Spirit is going to see to it that you're formed and fashioned into the likeness of Christ. Now, these two things. First of all, we struggle in this life with our own weaknesses. Um, my Granny Hay would say, can't, never, could, do nothing. Terrible grammar, great theology. We were not allowed to say, I can't do something. And I think there's sometimes we have to admit, unless God kicks in, I'm sunk. <laughs> but the idea is this, is we, we fail so many times in the Christian life for lack of effort. Because the Holy Spirit is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than we could ask or think. But all too often, if you've been raised under that cloud of doubt that you can't do something, you second guess every decision that you make. And you even wonder this way. You, you see, if you correct me, if you, if you think I'm wrong, but this is the idea. Well, nobody in my family has ever served God greatly. Nobody in my family has ever gone to college. Nobody in my family has ever... And whatever you want to plug in there... We have a tendency to limit our God-given abilities because we don't recognize the power and presence of God in our lives. Let me promise you this. According to God's Word, God will not call you to do something that He is not ready to empower and complete it in you. You have to give that over to God. And... Uh, um, Have you ever asked yourself this question, God, are you holding out on me? Seems like other folks understand what was going on Wednesday night when Brother Rick was talking about the Holy Spirit. And I just don't get it. Are you? Is there something I'm missing? Am I dumb? I promise you that's the devil trying to convince you to stay put and to stay stuck. But if you want to know God, God is driving that because you've been exposed to the Word. If you want to know God, God is driving that because His Holy Spirit is convic convicting, convincing, or comforting you. The, it's all about God. All you have to do, and I don't want to say go with the flow because that sounds almost ethereal, but, but all you have to do is let God do His mighty work in you. And He that's begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's what the Word says. Finally, we are recipients of God's divine nature. Um, if you have two kids in your family, isn't one almost always obedient, well-behaved, and the other one ornery as they come? Can I get an amen? If you have two kids, one of them is going to be one. And one's, they're never, you never have two good kids. You never have two ornery kids. All too often you have one good kid that behaves and the other one that's shot out of a cannon. And it's just, and if you have more than that, then, then there's more possibility. What I'm saying to you is, is all too often we have a tendency to think that that good kid is going to be the blessing of your life. But what's really wonderful is when that ornery kid gets with the program of God. And they are transformed by the power of the Word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And they start to blossom because the process that God sends us through is going to be complete. And I just, I just look and long for those kind, kinds of moments. Uh, now this is what we've heard, and we call it New Age. It's actually just old broken theology that we have a new name on it. But New Age tells you this. You need to discover the God within you. Baloney. <laughs> you, were, you were not born with God in you. You were created in the image of God. You were born with a broken nature and a broken spirit and a broken soul. And the only thing that can restore that is the Word of God driven and empowered by the person of the Holy Spirit. 
And once you accept God into your life, the process begins. Salvation is instantaneous. But growing in Christ takes you every day of your living and breathing and working. It's always a long, drawn-out process. Um, and yet, I'll guarantee you, if I, if I could set our old wheels down here today, and at 95, say, Earl, do you still struggle with human nature? You know what he'd tell me? Yeah, Brother Rick, you can guarantee that. But then we might sing that little children's Bible school song, Sunday school. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be, cause what? He's still working on me. The Holy Spirit is at work in this church because he's at work in you. Question or comment? Either you're thoroughly satisfied or thoroughly confused. Stand with us and we'll have a hymn of invitation. Will? It, it, it's, it's, oh yeah, we've, we've taught on it. We don't, we don't fixate on it as if it's sinless perfection. This side of heaven. That happens when we get to heaven and this old flesh drops off, we are sanctified. But we're, the way God looks at us through the blood of Christ, we're already complete because Jesus paid the price for our sin debt. Amen. If you have a decision to make, you're invited to come. If you have a prayer request that I could help you with, I'd be honored to do just that. You come on this first verse. Bless you, if you will. Stay with us for a business meeting. If you can't, we'll see you Sunday morning. Please pray toward that end.